So, uh, hi everybody, thanks for coming here. Today is an honor to have here Professor Isabel Gallagher, also kind to come in Rome to give us this uh, colloquium. And uh, so the title of, of the talk is on the dynamics of dilute gases. So, quite general. So I, I hope that it's not too specialistic so we can understand everybody here. We have mixed the background. So. And anyway, uh, Isabel is a professor at the Normal Superior in Paris uh, and also a member of the CNS uh, Department of Mathematics and Application. Uh, she's one of the main specialists at the international level in uh, uh, partial differential equations, in, in particular in fluid uh, mechanics uh, and also in kinetic equations and so on. Um, she worked with many collaborators uh, on the uh, um, Hilbert six problems for uh, a huge part of her life. And uh, she obtained a lot of uh, prizes. Uh, uh, I read the uh, Paul Dostou, Emile Brute, uh, the uh, Prix Sophie Germain, and also the silver medal from the CNRS. So that's really a pleasure to have somebody here. Uh, you can uh, start with your talk. Thanks very much. Thanks for the invitation. I'm really very, very happy to be here. Um, so yes, I'll be talking about uh, the dynamics of dilute gases. So I understand this is a colloquium. I hope it will sort of be a colloquium. Please stop me whenever you have any problems with what I'm saying. Um, if you have any questions, you can report as Thierry or Sergio or the people have been working on this problem for a long time, uh, as, long, as well as uh, last time today. But uh, so please feel free to interrupt me or ask them if there's any problems. I'll be happy to try to answer. Okay, so um, so the, what we're trying to do, what a lot of people are trying to do, in some sense, is to try to reconcile two ways of uh, analyzing, of uh, describing fluids or gases. Okay, and so um, essentially, you can say there are two options: either you study the movement of each independent particle which constitutes a fluid, and then you can just write down every equation and if you know where each particle is and what its velocity is, and you know everything about it, in some sense. Okay. Then obviously, at our um, human level, maybe that's not so interesting. Right? So for instance, in this room, uh, except for around me, I guess we are all pretty still, so it looks like nothing's happening. The velocity of the air is zero, but each particle is moving constantly. Okay. So it's not because you have exactly the velocity and the location of each particle that you can guess what the velocity of the fluid around you is, or the temperature or the density. So the idea, of course, is to use other equations to describe uh, the oceans or the air or whatever. Those equations are other equations, that mean those equations, and these are macroscopic. Okay, so the question uh, uh, we're interested in is trying to understand how to go from one description to the other. In particular, how to go from the microscopic description of the gas to the macroscopic description of the gas. Okay, so that's the, that's the goal, of course. Well, I mean, we won't be able to do it today. To warn you, you don't know how to do that. But let me just start by writing down the equations for particles. Okay, so okay, those are just rough figures of how many particles are there in a glass of hot water or in the, in the air in this room. And uh, okay, so all those particles are moving all the time, like I said, pretty fast, and they're sliding on. So once I'm, I'm given that, I can write down the equations of motion for each of the particles. Okay, and they'll be classical particles, so the equations will be uh, the Newton's laws. Okay, so here they are. So uh, from now on, my particles are just identical uh, balls, okay, dimension two, three, or whatever, mass one, then I'll be mass in the equations. And so to locate the, these particles, I'm going to call xi the center of each of the balls. i is just the label of particles. So nothing depends, of course, on the label itself, but I have to label the particles to follow them. So xi is a vector, let's say, for this talk in the periodic box. And you give yourself a box of size one. We have lots of uh, hard spheres moving around in this box. Their centers are located at xi. I is going from one to n. If n is going to be hard spheres, and so the velocity of those particles is called v. The time derivative of the position is velocity. The velocity is a vector in r. 
And then, uh, just to make things as simple as possible, actually, we don't really know how to do much more. We're going to assume there's no force acting on the system, so the acceleration is zero. That's the second equation up there. It's kind of a different velocity. Okay, so that's very, very easy. That particle that is running straight now. Cost of speed. But of course, what happens is that they collide pretty often. And so you have to determine what the collision rules are. Okay, so here uh, I've written down collision rules, which are uh, elastic collision, the conservation of momentum and energy, which is what's taken at the bottom of the slide. And so you have formula. We don't really care about the exact formula. They're well known uh, uh, decap laws, I guess. Relating the incoming velocities, which I wrote with a V prime here, to the outgoing velocities, which don't have okay. And omega here will be the vector which links the center of my particle to the unit vector. So each particle is very small, where diameter is epsilon. Okay, so when xi minus xj is equal to epsilon, then things will touch and velocity will touch. And again, omega is a unit vector, so it's very large compared to epsilon, relating the, uh, the center to my particles. Okay, so this is uh, a closed system, you can solve it if you like. Of course, it's ridiculous if I try to solve it. There's at least two reasons. One is that we don't really care to you know where each particle is. So that's one reason. And the other one is that it's a huge equation. Right? If you imagine three, then you have six degrees of freedom for each particle times the number of particles. But anyway, there, uh, there it is. So, uh, as I said, we don't think these equations are really the right object to study. Uh, if, you're under, if you're interested anyway in macroscopic information. So the question is how to extract the distribution from the equations. One, really a small number of equations which would be effective equations, which would be used to predict for instance the weather or whatever. And so uh, what's written here is that uh, this effective equation is probably uh, related to irreversibility. So why is that? Um, because the, the system I showed you before is actually time reversible, right? If you change uh, t to minus t, then just change all velocity to i to minus the i, and then the system is like Which means another way, uh, another way of saying that is that if you play a movie of your <laughs> particle system, in one of uh, the time going one way or the other, you don't think everything will be reasonable. Okay, so this is going to be reversible. Now, the, the equations we expect to find will be irreversible. So this is a beautiful movie I've had with you because uh, uh, this is a PDF, unfortunately. So I can tell you the story. <laughs> uh, okay, so the story is, I mean, uh, I'm sure a lot of people know that story, but I like that story because it's really cool. So let me, let me go through it. So you, you should imagine here you have two containers, okay, and they're uh, linked by a small little corridor. And so at time zero, you just fill the first container with particles. And they're actually numerical particles, meaning they don't collide. So they totally ignore each other. They just, whenever they cross, they overlap. So they, they are totally, they don't know they're actually overlapping. And so what happens, of course, is that the particles hit the boundary with a elastic collision. So, so after a while, some part going through the, the passage and it goes to the other side. So just imagine it's going with a lot of particles. And so if you wait for a few seconds, 10 seconds, if you're given, let's say, 500 particles on one side at time zero, and after 10 seconds, you have about 250. Mm -hmm. okay. Never exactly, well, hardly ever exactly 250, but you have something around 250. Okay. Uh, obviously, they, it's not always the same particles. They have labels, but you don't see the labels. You don't see their colors. It's identical to you. So it looks like you have the same number of particles on your side. You do have the same number of particles on your side. But now what you can do for fun is play that movie the other way back. Okay, so you have lots of particles on each side, and then you wait, and then in 10 seconds, all of them go to the okay, That cannot happen in real time. You can't imagine all the, I, I have lots of air in there, that all the air goes to the corner of the room. That does not happen. So there's something wrong in this because it's a, it's a paradox because each particle it's just going in straight lines, hitting the boundary of the container, so that's it. Doesn't even know there are other particles around there. Okay. So the movement of each particle is reversible. Okay. So only one particle is moving in one side or the other, there's no problem. No particle knows there are other particles around, but then at the end, the whole thing is time irreversible. So what we see at a microscopic level is irreversible. 
although each particle is reversible. So this obviously will have to find what to understand that it comes from the fact that we affect the equation. Our human scale things are rather irreversible. So to understand this, uh, one thing you can do to all this, uh, you can actually find on Wikipedia, I think. <clears throat> you can do the same experiment with four particles. And then you can plot how many times, well, plot, sorry, the number of particles on the length of time. So there are two containers, at first you have four on one side, two on the other, and then you start counting <clears throat> at each second how many particles are on the left. So times zero, you have four, I don't know if you can that, but that's the number on the top is four. Times zero, you have four. Times one, you have two. That means two on each side. Times uh, three, you have three. That means one, three. And so you see that quite often, actually, all the particles are on the right. left, right? So you have four there. And quite often, actually, they're on the right. It's like zero. Okay. And so pretty often, one container is empty, or the other one is empty. Now, if you decide to put 500 particles on the left, zero. Then you see what happens immediately is that the number of particles on the, the left-hand side just drops <laughs> until it gets to about, to about 250, and then it just fluctuates around. Okay. So you see, when you have a lot of particles, very quickly you have just about the same number of particles on each side, and never, ever, where you have all the particles on one side. Okay. So of course, this is related to the number of particles. Why? Because if you count um, what each particle is doing, each particle has two possibilities, left or right. Okay. So the number of microscopic configurations you have is two to the n. Which means that two possibilities have n particles. Okay. But uh, at our macroscopic level, we don't see any numbers or any colors in the particles. All we see is how many particles are in one side of the other. So either there are n, or n minus one, or n minus two, or zero. That means there are n plus one macroscopic configurations. So, in some sense, the probability that all the particles are on the left, for instance, will be like 2 to the minus 7. It will happen in some sense, right? Because it is reversible. But at our human scale, it's not. We have to wait for so long that we just won't see it. Okay, and you see the difference between the microscopic and the macroscopic uh, states. <clears throat> the numbers of the logarithm, okay, that means the entry. Okay, so, if you have a lot of particles, you have this, uh, there's a huge difference between microscopic and macroscopic. And that's why what we will end up finding will be irreversible of it, original models. Okay, so at some point, we have to keep that in mind. Uh, let's try to understand this a Right, so now uh, what we want to do uh, at Silver to be tested with this problem is to try to understand uh, in some mathematical way some kind of limiting process. You see that in some sense, the number of particles has to be very, very large to get through it. Four particles know how to do it. So some kind of limiting process, for instance, in the number of particles, which will lead from the atomistic view, which we wrote down, to the loss of the uh, motion of continuum, which I didn't write down, which I'll have you say before. <coughs> and so uh, what he actually said in the middle of the sentence was that um, he could be inclined uh, to use Mr. Goldsmith's So we'll actually use Mr. Goldsmith's equation, which I'll be uh, writing down in Okay, so what we'll do today is actually not uh, really study fluid, but rather go into particles and volume. I'll tell you a little bit about that. Also, to understand how to go into fluid, but we'll mainly be interested in the first one. But yeah, I was going to get wrong. So, uh, so what Boltzmann suggests is uh, to stop looking at each particle, but look at more the distribution of an, a random and average particle, meaning how many particles are at time t at position x, which is strongly to the x, with velocity t. Okay, so I just stand somewhere and I say, okay, how many particles do I have here, which have a given velocity, okay, at, at some given time. So this is a, is a probability distribution. This function f will be the solution of the Boltzmann equation. So it's a function that depends on time, on x, which is just three variables, in that case, with three coordinates, and v, which is a much reduced uh, phase space. And so, um, actually, we can't really measure this, this function, the property of we feel at the feeling level. What we feel is rather um, averages of this function against velocity. So take f and start integrating against all possible velocities. That gives you a function of time and space. It gives you how many particles are at position x at one time. That's the density of okay. If you integrate against v, that will give you the velocity of v. That's really what we feel. 
And if you integrate against p squared, that will give you the temperature. And so what you can um, guess for the moment is that if we compute f, then doing those integrations, we'll get to the dependency of Boltzmann said. OK, so here is Boltzmann's equation. So I guess uh, I know a lot of you have seen it before, but I am supposing some of you have not. Okay, if everyone has seen this, give you a quick uh, overview of this equation. The first time you see it, you're sort of uh, panicked. Well, I was panicked. But uh, you shouldn't. Uh, fine. So let's see. The left hand side, if you just put zero on the right hand side, okay, so forget the left hand side of the equation, this is the transport. Okay, just telling you to know how many particles at time t uh, have position x and velocity d. I just move back to velocity d and I see how many particles were at time 0 uh, at uh, position x minus d. So that would be fine if there were no collisions. But as we saw, there are binary collisions. Particles hit uh, in two polar. I didn't talk about more than two collisions at some time because that doesn't happen. Okay. But, um, if the measure of the initial data, which would give you more than two people colliding at the same time, so you say that you ignore that. So that's why the left, right hand side here is progressive. The particles only hit when there are two things. Okay, and then so if I remember that F is a probability distribution, that means it's now negative. So on the right hand side, anything positive is treating me with particles at position X plus D. Anything negative is saying I've lost particles at position X plus D. So maybe I can look at the negative term on the right-hand side. I have a minus f times f at time t and x. One of the f's is at uh, velocity v. The other one is velocity w. W is anything. I'm integrating against the whole space. So here I'm saying if I have a particle of velocity v, which is an x, and a particle of velocity w, which is hitting my particle at position x, then I create another velocity. Okay, so I've lost a particle of velocity. Or I've lost a particle. Let's say that lost particle with lost particle. Okay, so that's why I have a minus. Then the first term is telling you, on the other hand, if I have a particle of velocity w prime hitting a particle of velocity v prime, then I get a plot of particles of velocity v. Okay, with the relations between primes and lost primes. Okay, so this sort of explains the integral over w and uh, ff minus ff. Then the last thing you might uh, wonder about is this uh, term with a plus. So, okay, so this is a cross section. This is in some sense measuring how strong your, your collision is. Okay, so I'm just waving hands here. Of course, that's the same thing. But essentially, what it's saying is that uh, you see, if, if v minus w dot omega is zero, so omega is the vector between the two particles, and v minus w is the relative velocity. Okay, so if v minus w is orthogonal to omega. That means that particles are actually moving in a parallel way. They're not really colliding. You have zero edge. And the other thing that can happen is the other way around. If p minus w is parallel to omega, that's the worst that can happen. A head on collision, you can jump back. And that's the strongest term. I'm not proving anything, I'm just explaining you should have something like that uh, in the integral. Okay, um, so that's the Boltzmann equation. And the question is how do you go from particles to the Boltzmann? So the first thing you can wonder maybe is what property does this uh, equation have? So if you remember, I wrote that down in the previous slide. If you, you remember the conservation of uh, momentum and energy, it's easy to check that the integral of f, the integral of f against v, and the integral of f against v squared is constant. So just using those uh, those properties, <coughs> small conservation is not very hard. So essentially, you you remember that momentum. Um, density and temperature are globally constant over space and time. One thing you can also do, which also uses properties of this uh, integral, is multiply your equation by log f, which you are allowed to, and then you notice that q of f times log f is always uh, non positive. Okay, and that will, that's just a sort of exercise using uh, properties, increasing properties of the logarithm. It's very easy to check. But that tells you that the entropy, or F log F entropy, is decaying in time. Okay, so if you're a physicist, you may be worried, but actually physicists call minus F log F entropy. But F log F is decreasing, which is interesting. Uh, that's what I 
found that you have in your equation on your solution, whatever happens, that will never go up. And it's also telling you that the Boltzmann equation is highly irreversible. So if you found a quantity that's decreasing, times change t to minus t will be increasing, but then the equation doesn't want it to be. So the equation is highly irreversible. Uh, one thing you can also try to do if you're given an equation and you want to solve it is try stationary, stationary solution. So one obvious stationary solution is zero. And the other one, uh, which is um, pretty obvious also if you remember you have conservation of energy, is the Gaussian in the box. Remember my state variables in the, in the fourth the box. So this is a other solution. And this is also a stationary solution. It actually depends on each term. Okay, so now to solve the equation, you can do two things. Uh, as usual, in a sense, you're given a time uh, term to the E, you can try to get the distance in, of unique solutions, the distance of global solutions, you want to know if they go in time to time, the usual questions, which I'll only address by giving you some results. So the first results you can prove is under some uh, regularity assumptions in your <coughs> data, then you can solve uniquely for a short time your equation. Typical nonlinear statement, give your give the initial data, which is good enough, I do some kind of fixed points, and I get for a short time uh, a neutral. Okay, so here I what I said is if your initial data is bounded by Gaussian, then if you're ready to lose half of what you had at the beginning, I have one point half, I have one point quarter, I lost a bit of my estimates, then I have a solution of half. If you want to lose, if you're allowed to lose one eighth, you have a solution for the orbit then and your fixed point is off in some sense, so when you run out of it makes sense of your collision integral. So maybe all you can remember here is that if you're Gaussian, you have a Gaussian decay with velocities, then you have a unique solution locally. Okay, the same local in time is just like if you're solving DTX equal to F squared. <coughs> Okay, now if you want your solution to be global, then all you what you should do is assume some kind of smallness assumption. It's just the usual stuff that you get point. And essentially, either if you're very small or if you're very close to a Gaussian, then you can get this. Okay, so that's one thing you can do is you just forget the structure of the equation, say the equation is by DPS equal to F squared, roughly, and get that from the theorem. What you can also do is try to use the structure of the equation, meaning use the entropy. Per theorem, if you do that, then you'll get global solutions because the entropy will not go over time to time. But, uh, okay, f log f is not so well, um, doesn't work so well with q of f, so you don't really get a uh, classical solution by all, it's just you don't even get a distribution solution, you get a renormalized solution. A universal solution. But then those solutions are global. Maybe that's for the Logan theorem, you have to, to pay a small price in beta. Is the, but the small is price is one quarter. For, 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 right? It's the same? At time t, it was not. No, no, uh, I've lost, I've had beta over two now. I used to have beta. Ah, okay. Yeah, beta I'm two. sorry, that, that's, that's a, why. Thank you, the smallest. Okay. I just <laughs> removed it from beta. I just removed it from beta. It's optimal time in zero. Yeah, okay. I'm sorry. It's not okay. It wasn't great. I couldn't the beta okay, prime okay, lower okay, than okay. the. Uh, right, so that's just a crash course of Boltzmann. Now let's see uh, how we go from particles to fluids. So first, how do you go from Boltzmann to fluids? So this I'll just tell you. I'm not going to do it at all today. But the idea is to say um, we're going to put back some kind of non-dimensional uh, variable to my equation, uh, namely the Knudsen number or the mean free path. So if you do that, then you get the Boltzmann equation with the right-hand side, which has a one over alpha. And the trick, the, 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 the recipe is to say, take the limit alpha going to zero, mm -hmm. which means more and more collisions. I have no more particles, but I remember collisions with this one over alpha. And uh, if you do that, then you start taking the integrals I told you about, and v, uh, v squared. Then the whole trick when alpha goes to zero, you'll recover three dependent equations for those quantities. Okay, just one comment here. I told you when you want to get unique solutions, you're looking for equations as if it was DTF equal to F squared. Now I have DTF equal to 1 over alpha squared. Lifetime of this equation is alpha. 
not the case. Without the case. So uh, obviously there's work to do if you want to prove a fluid mechanics uh, equation from this equation, letting alpha go into zero. So what people do is uh, actually not exactly this, but this equation, but say f is equal to a Gaussian plus something, okay, and then the something will satisfy the fluid mechanics equation. And that way you sort of gain uh, something on the left side. This is technical, and I, I won't say anything more unless you insist. Okay, so what's the, 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 the rules of the game? So I'm given my particle system, the periodic box. I'm given my Newton laws. And I want to find fluid mechanics equations. Okay, what can I play with? I can play with the size of the particles, their number. So I should first play with their number, but obviously if the size doesn't shrink, I'm going to have a problem. I have to go zero with the number of particles. <coughs> and then, as I said, alpha has to go zero. Alpha was that extra parameter in my system. Okay. So now, what do I do? I need to scale the number of particles with their size. So the first thing I'm going to do is just assume I have a dilute gas, meaning that the volume occupied by my particles is going to zero with epsilon, which means that n times epsilon b, that's the volume of my particles, the constant is going to be the dilute gas by my process. Okay, and then remember alpha was a mean free path, so essentially what I need is there to be one over alpha collision in time one, essentially. Everything is just very, very end-weighting, so you can clear on the relations between n and epsilon and alpha. Okay, so now give yourself one particle, which is here, in gray, and assume it's going in a straight line, then the volume is going to occupy in time t is roughly tv times epsilon v minus v. It's v times v times the, the, the surface of my field. And now, if I, if I want to be sure I have one over alpha collisions, roughly what I need to do is <coughs> to say that the number of particles around me, which is roughly n, times the volume I occupy, which is roughly one, minus one, that should be one over alpha. Okay, so this is a scaling relation, the kind of low density uh, scaling, like mode or Boltzmann grad scaling, and this will be given for us. For us, for the number of particles times this f on one minus z minus one is one over alpha. If you don't like alpha, take alpha away from there. And then one day we'll be the alpha But uh, so that's the scaling we're going to fix. Fix for the equivalent exactly equal to one alpha, but it looks like one. <coughs> right? So n times epsilon d minus one is actually going to infinity when alpha is going to zero. Okay, just do the one graph. Is that all right? That's the scaling we're going to fix. Right. So now, uh, what's known in this? Uh, question. I have particles, I have fluids, how do I go from one to the other? So to my knowledge, I think essentially nothing is known if you want to go from the Newton law, I gave you, I gave you the order one to the other. The only thing you can do is uh, add noise to your system, so your particles are lattice, for instance, and like I mean, their velocities change in a random way. Those are, there are a lot of things known in that direction, which is not exactly what we want to do, because we really want to start with a deterministic system no noise initially. So our question is, you have our system I gave you before, no noise, I want to get these mechanics equations. To my knowledge, um, essentially nothing is there. So let's use Boltzmann. So to use Boltzmann, we're going to do uh, the proof in well, the proof. Here we'll do two, two steps. One step is going from particles to Boltzmann, fix alpha. Okay. One graph will come to the scaling, and physical parameters. So go from your particle system to Boltzmann. Once you've done that, you have your Boltzmann with one alpha, let alpha go to zero and time zero. And then the idea then is just to both of us uh, one after the other and, and get what you want. Boltzmann will be some kind of intermediate step between uh, particles and fluids. So as I said, uh, there are things that a lot of results known between Boltzmann and heavy folks, for instance, or compressible orders. I gave you here a, a few references. So I, I won't be talking about that at all today. For us, this is for the black box. Okay, once I found Boltzmann, then we go and see those people and that's how we calculate. Okay. So what we want to do is really get the Boltzmann equation with one alpha on a time scale of course that's not alpha. Okay. We want to plug in those results actually. So we need to let's be able to let alpha go to zero. Okay. okay, so uh, I was told that we supposed to be technical. But I didn't really listen, so I, I, I have to be at some point a little bit technical. Okay, so this I guess this is the bad part of this talk. 
Well, that was getting worse. It's already bad, but now it's just getting worse. But I have to explain you what we do. So if I gave you equations, I told you what we want to do. Now that's the right thing. See, for instance, if I gave you this f, plot the relation between f and my huge particle system. So Okay, so here we go. So um, let's go back to the beginning. And what I'm allowed to play with essentially is my particle system at time zero. So just like this, I, I can decide where my particle is R at time zero. So if, I, if I've done that, then I just let the system go, and that's it. I can't play with it. So like the I can't do anything. The system is playing with giving me the, all the information. I, I can't do anything. So the only thing we can do here is decide where my initial. Um, particles are or fix my initial density distribution. So my particles are living in this uh, phase space, which is a set of uh, positions which have to be away by epsilon. Okay, and all possible velocities. The phase space is d epsilon n. If I'm given n particles, then I need xi minus x day to be always larger than epsilon. Particles do not overlap. Okay, so phase space is full of holes like that. And now the initial probability density is given by this formula here. So let's go through it slowly. Maybe we can go from right to left. So at the very right, I have a product of n copies of x0. That's saying that my particles are identically distributed according to some given x0. It's called f. It's my initial data form. So initially, all my particles have this distribution f0. It could be a Gaussian, for instance, in which case nothing is happening. So the Gaussian is the equilibrium to my system. Or it's any probability distribution. Then you move back a little bit, you see this characteristic function of the epsilon n, meaning my particles are in lateral drive. They're almost independent, except that they're not lateral. Then move back, you have this mu n uh, over the n. That's because uh, we're in this grand canonical transformation, which I will talk about at the top of the slide, meaning that I don't know exactly how many particles I have. All I know is their average, which we call mu epsilon, average number of particles, which is defined by one over epsilon minus one. I've forgotten, but we have this um, uh, boltzmann grad theory, n times epsilon minus one is equal to one. That's how And now it's not fixed, but the average number of particles is one over epsilon minus one. And so this mu n over n, is the factorial n is telling me I have a Poisson distribution. Right, and then you, as usual, you divide by the position function, and then you have. So my initial distribution is exactly that. And now all you do is say, now I know that. What happens to this, to this distribution as time goes on? Okay. So what's the probability, in some sense, of having n particles sitting exactly at x1, xn, v1, vn? So x1, xn, v1, v1, n is called the z. Capital z, z is the whole. All my variables, position and velocity. So actually, the equation satisfied by this w is very easy. It's just a transport equation. Because my particles are going to collide. Okay. And when they collide, that means my, my function w is on standard. Xi minus xj is equal to epsilon. So I have a transport equation, really, everyone <coughs> going in straight lines, except they're hitting the boundary. And what happens at the boundary? Well, if you have two particles hitting the boundary, their velocities must be changed with the hidden rule, which means that W has to be changed. Okay, so when your W going in straight lines, when W hits the boundary, it changes the velocity of the two particles, so that xi and xh are touching, and then going to go on. <coughs> what you call the boundary are the boundary of the holes in time? Exactly, exactly. You can, I can't draw a picture. You can say holes, you can say also on top of the head, it depends how you want to see things. In any way, but if you're given the next sign, it's a sphere around it. The holes, yeah. You can also say x i minus x x one minus x two is epsilon is also the same. Four dimensional space. Get it? Anyway, yeah, so we don't that. Okay, so so now we're not totally done, but we have. We know exactly what the configuration of my space, of my particle is. The probability of having capital N particles at time t in Zn is just this transport equation with the boundary condition. So there are still too many particles. Right? What I want is uh, one particle. I want the Boltzmann equation. The Boltzmann equation is telling me 
uh, is a function living on the one dimensional so the idea is to integrate in some sense this w against all variables that will give you a function of one variable. That's one way of defining the one particle correlation function. The other way of defining it is written here. So when I talk about an expectation, it means with respect to this probability. Okay, probabilities and expectations are always with respect to the initial population. So this uh, Expected value, E epsilon, is exactly integrating over W, coming over all N. So what I'm looking here at here is the empirical distribution. You give yourself a nice function H, any nice function H, computed at the configuration Z i, sum over all the particles. And if you compute the expectation of this thing, it gives you the interval of your H, which with again the function s that this function s is the one particle the marginal right and so now the claim is that this function converges to the solution of the Boltzmann equation okay in some so here's the theorem this theorem is to Lanford uh, and so what we proved is that if your initial data is distributed according to this F0, which is F0, okay, assume F0 is nice and uh, bounded by a Gaussian, which is one four, then this F X on one does converge for the solution of the Boltzmann equation from time t, which is roughly the time I gave you before mm -hmm. Okay, and beta zero and beta is the same. Oh sorry, this is horrible. So the minus is only four times. Oh, okay, now I see it in the side. That's why I'm so fine. So this theorem is telling you on a short time, then you do have convergence of this uh, one particle uh, function to the solution of the Boltzmann equation. And he says more. He also tells you that if you look at the n particle, meaning you want to see also probability of having n particles sitting at z1 to n, okay, for any labels, and so over all possible labels, dividing by one over, over mu to the n. This defines the n particle correlation function, and he proves that this converges to n copies of the whole thing. That's known as the propagation of chaos. Right? It's telling you that initially my particles were almost uh, identically distributed. Right? They were just, this is a uh, exclusion function, they were both independent but almost. Then as n goes to infinity, or so the number of particles, the average number of particles goes to infinity, they become again independent. Each one is, is living with the distribution f, the same one. Okay, so that's of course not true if you have a fixed number of particles. When two particles just met, they're definitely not in the same. But in the limit with n going to infinity, what he's telling you is that actually the probability, well, their, their distribution is identical, identical and they're That's the theory. Uh, right, so let me just give you a sketch of proof. So I just want to show you why you have a short time result. And uh, actually, it's a catastrophe, right? Because remember, if you put one graph alpha in your equation, t becomes alpha. And that's why we do not uh, go all the way from particle to two is because the time on which Lanford is here is here. So uh, here's the end particle correlation function. As I said, you have another way of finding it. Just like the marginal, so I don't like this formula. I know it's technical, just forget this formula and just believe me that this guy here is the same as the one I gave you before and satisfies a transport equation. Again, slightly more complicated than before. The right hand side is not zero. Why? Because uh, what I've done to find this equation is I took the transport equation and find out w and integrate it. So it's a but now, if you integrate a time derivative, then you start having problems with standard conditions. Okay, Green formula and Green formula is exactly what this is doing. Don't worry, it's just there. All it's telling you, you don't want to look at the formula, it's just telling you that the probability distribution of n particles is fed by collisions between two particles. The Cn n plus 1, which is here, is a collision involving Fn plus 1. So actually, you have here a, huge, a whole hierarchy of equations. So the equation on F1, for example, n equals 1, involves F2. Okay, so to understand F1, you need to understand F2. Then the equation on F2 involves F2. 
the cipher theory equation on f n is in all of that. If you want to understand the limit of f1, you actually need to understand the limit of f1. That's why Lanford also proves that f n goes to the n copies of f, which is up to the same thing, because you need to study f1. So Lanford's idea is to say, let me write this PE in another way. That's an interesting idea. Uh, I didn't know before reading Lanford. Is you can like to be, that means you love to be, you can be with you for something. But then he says, instead of writing that, write down, write down the two event formulation. Okay, meaning you, you say the transport, V dot grade, that is replaced by this operator S, which is what exactly is named. An operator of all the characteristics. Right, so this is the geomet formula, and then of course you see you start with uh, transporting the initial data plus the geomet term, which involves f f n plus one. But then you can play the same game with f n plus one. Say okay, transport of n plus one particle times zero plus geomet f n plus two, and then iterate again. And so what's interesting with this is that you replace your PDE by a formula that is relating the solution at time t to the initial data. The formula is horrible, but it's a, it's a theory question. And so essentially what you're saying, so Lanford's idea is to say, look at this formula and try to, try to understand what it means. Fix m. m is essentially like the number of collisions your particle can have. So let's fix m. And then just read the formula. S, n is saying you have n particles. They go, in, in, uh, well, they go with their flow and hitting each other just together. And at time t1, a new particle comes in the game because one of those ends has hit has hit something. Might have n plus n plus one particles to play. You follow the n plus one, they hit each other if they like, then the n plus two is coming because one of them has hit someone else. Okay, now you follow the n plus two. Blah 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 until you start to talk at n plus n. And then you do that for all. So it's a, it's, it's not a very nice formula, but it's it's not an a PDA, it's a formula relating solution at time t to the initial data. And now all you have to do is look at this formula, prove the theories it's converging, and then just take limits in each term of the theory. Okay, if your theories is converging, then fix n and find the limit at that point of zero of each term of the theory. Okay, once you've done that, identify the limit and say, ah, it's actually n copies of f is equal to that theory. That's what I'm done. Because I have a unique, uniqueness argument saying that I have only one solution to this. Okay, so prove the series convergence, find limits of each term, and then recognize the both term here. Recognize that f, n copies of f is equal to that series. Okay, so let's see, is this con series converging? So you all forget, forgot to write it in the series. I knew what CNN plus one was. But actually, CNN plus one is telling you one particle is hitting one among n. So it's called n, which is one hitting. Then you're also losing your v, but forget that. Then uh, that means that all those cn n plus ones I'm, add, I'm putting one after the other are costing n times n plus one times the last one. Okay. Factorial m, sorry. n is fixed. You're adding you have all n possible factorial m, roughly. But then the time integration is over a simplex. You gain t to the n divided by factorial m. Factorial m is over here. Good. And so you just have a TN. The TN is inverse, so TN is okay. So the proof of Langford is exactly that, and the score time is exactly that. What you've done here is totally forgotten that the CNN has a bunch of structure, the gashes are cancelling everything. You forgot everything, you just consider it just like a square. You forgot the, all the structure of the equation, you get a short time. But now we're happy for a short time, the series is converging. Let's take limits. Okay, so what happens is that uh, the CNN plus ones are just converging to quantize interactions. Do what's harder is to understand the limit of my when I have n particles just going in straight lines or hitting each other all over. What's the limit when I find those zero? Well, the limit is uh, these n particles are just not magical. Okay, because Boltzmann has no uh, direct one. So if two particles meet for Boltzmann, they just pass. There's no direct one. There's only no Together, you need to prove that when I have n particles, roughly if I have an n plus one add, added to my system, uh, if it hits someone, it will. Those people I've never met before. Everything is invisible. So that's why it's a huge factor. 
which means in some sense, well, I need to eliminate recollision. I need to say that if two particles meet, they've never met in the past. If they had, they would not be independent and both really Okay. So that's uh, sort of the technical part. Then I have an uh, neatness argument like that. So again, what you have to eliminate is recollisions, and you see that the recollision is giving you the arrow of time. And here is your so I told you when two particles meet, the next one had met in the past. Okay, but a recollision in this uh, setting, if I take a uh, arrow of time the other way, is a collision. It can be the first collision. Okay, the second collision in one way is the first collision in the other way. Okay. So that means that the proof and even the statement of Langford is irrelevant. You have given an arrow of time, there's no way you can get it. Okay, so uh, okay. just a few minutes left. Again, uh, what's the problem with the short time? It's due to that uh, n, n plus 1, n plus n I had, which gave you a temporal m, which cancels the one that was uh, here in the screen, so then you just have a geometric series. Okay, that's why you have short time. You really would like to to, to understand more of this growth of the tree, because even if everything is at equilibrium, we focus about that. Here, everything is. Uh, Sometimes we're not seeing at all the structure of the nonlinear term. And again, if you put one over alpha, then your sign is alpha, and you can't do this. So, um, okay, just one comment here. If you're linearized, if you're close to a Gaussian, then you can work harder and get something in much longer time, so I won't talk about that today. So, um, I guess I should stop uh, very soon. So, I just wanted to mention what's been done recently against the uh, about that question. So, I mean, Langford's results in moments is really, really better, except in the years that we study. So, to try to, to do better, uh, one way we tried to do with that was try to, let's say, look around Boltzmann. Exactly, we try to understand things around that, meaning if I understand better the proof, that that makes it better. And to understand better the proof, we could try to understand better the error in Boltzmann. Okay, not the uh, so, what we did uh, do is understand fluctuations around the Boltzmann equation and the linear equation. Okay, so I guess uh, I should stop. Or can you give me a, a few minutes, a bit more? Thank you. So, I will talk about large deviations, just one word about fluctuations, and then I'll. So, one way of understanding uh, all this a little bit differently is to understand the Boltzmann equation like a law of large numbers. Meaning the following. Remember, we saw this empirical distribution before. I told you, to, right, if you compute that at function h, you get exactly what I'm looking for. One of the u is going to h of this. Okay, and so you can translate the Lamper's theorem exactly like the law of large, large numbers. The probability that this empirical distribution looks like this average, and in fact, the conversion of the whole equation is going to be an epsilon goes to zero. No, it's going to one. The probability that it looks like is going to one. And um, okay, so I won't I won't give you the proof of that, just an exercise. But okay, so what I want to do here is fluctuations. So for fluctuations, as you know, when you have a law of large numbers, the fluctuations you just retail and change over time. It's stronger. So you multiply by n to the one half. So here I have mu particles, so I multiply by this difference by mu to the one half. That gives me a fluctuation field. And it's easy to see that at time zero, small computation to see that at time zero, it does converge to a Gaussian time uh, value. And this variance is given by this formula. Okay, so at time zero, you know exactly what the saturation field is doing. And so the question is, how does that evolve at time of time? It's exactly the same thing. You get like f of t times h squared, or you get something more interesting. And so, uh, what we proved uh, recently was that this fluctuation field converges to a Gaussian field, as expected, but it solves uh, not a Boltzmann equation, but a fluctuating Boltzmann equation with a noise. I'll just show you that before we stop. And what I want to show you here is why something is happening, why you just don't, don't get what you might have expected if you hadn't thought of it, which is just the solution to Boltzmann times h squared. Okay, so to find uh, a Gaussian field, what one thing you can do is just compute this uh, log of the expectation here. And what you expect to get something Gaussian is that everything goes to zero except for the, the time in the term of order one, and that everything else is not. 
we don't have a variance in the transaction. And then we can get that kind of formula. So just compute things. Um, so compared to time zero, see what's happening here is that at time zero, if you do the same computation, I said my particles are independent, almost, except for the exclusion. What's the exclusion? Well, I'm saying that two particles can be closed. And the size of that depends on the D, the size of the, of the volume of the number one particle. So particles are almost independent up to epsilon zero. But now if I look at time t, what happens? What's the probability of two particles to be independent? Well, the size of the tube that they're following. So it's not a, it's not a ball anymore, it's a tube. The size epsilon d minus one. So epsilon to the d was totally negligible compared to u. Epsilon d minus one is exactly one of these. That's why you have an extra term here, two, which is the difference between uh, the two particle cor uh, correlation function and two copies of the one. Time zero is going to zero. Okay, but at time t, it's exactly the scaling that says it's actually going to something. It's O of one. So what we have to understand is how at time t, two particles, which look at their, their history, their collision history, how is their collision history different to just two copies of the collision history of each? Okay, so do collision history uh, meet at some point between time zero and time t? So I promise I'll just stop with this drawing, essentially in state. So across the uh, collision uh, history of two particles, take two particles, one and two, times t, and study between times t and times zero how many particles there could be. Okay, so it's <coughs> drawn by it's like a tree with two branches, have much more branches. Simple. At particle one, I follow its path, and each time it touches someone, I just add a branch to the tree to make it simple. I only have one branch. What, what can happen to those two particles is either their collision trees touch, meaning two particles touch, and it goes to the tree, or they don't, which is R means they're recollision, they, they touch in the, in the past, or they don't. But saying that two particles don't collide is a correlation between particles. So I'm saying they're not last to one. Okay, so tensor product is saying you ignore each other. So actually, this thing, they don't collide, is I ignore you, or I don't. Okay. Not ignoring means, for some reason, which is a mathematical reason, not a physical reason, my two trees will cross. I'm just writing uh, x different from y is equal to x. 1 minus x equals 1. Okay. So this is what we're in here. I have recollisions, or they ignore each other, that's right. Or they don't ignore each other, which means they pass at x long without colliding. It's a mathematical artifact. Okay. That's, that's how you, you recover a tensor product by doing that. And now you're essentially done. The difference between a two particle correlation function and two copies of one particle correlation function is three collisions in the past will overlap. That's something that uh, Schoen had understood a long time ago. The first time we read it, he wrote, half of these things are important, they're not supposed to, they're supposed to go zero. But actually, at this scaling and fluctuation scaling, they are very important. And so I'll just stop here. Here's the uh, theorem. Which says that the fluctuation field converges to a linearized Boltzmann equation. If L is, you see, you have the Boltzmann equation, F is the solution of Boltzmann. And at zero, it gives you an F, which is not given. And now this fluctuation field is following the linearized <laughs> Boltzmann equation, which is here, up to a uh, forcing term, which is stochastic. And uh, wait, the computer is very explicit. And I'll stop here. Thank you for your question. So, it's uh, one for the questions, comments. You can speak from your place because the camera, anyway, is following you when you speak. Okay. Carl. Practical 
Your question is, can you do that at the particle level? So you have uh, the cell of bed in the free motion, you have the uh, podastic motion due to fixed temperature. And then you perform the Boltzmann gradual limit, you get uh, the stochastic uh, Boltzmann equation, in which the Boltzmann equation, in which you add the noise and velocity. But from a mathematical point of view, I don't think that you get any other value. You don't have noise you know, it's not one of the DBs, that's what I mean. It's between the office. Ah, yeah. So, so not this kind of thing. Always about the domain DXD. I mean, the two products. It could be DXD on your team, because it can be the standard. No. no, because the domain is the function depends on t and on x and b, all the x's, all the b, and all the x's have to, have to satisfy x i minus x a all the x one. That's the function. Right. It's the phase space is they're not moving because the function itself depends on t x v, telling you how many particles, what's the distribution of particles which at time t are in this configuration x one, x two, t one, t zero. And x1 minus x2 has to be fixed. So, Sorry? So t explicit fixed. Exactly. So the phase space doesn't depend on time. It's just your you're given where x x and v live. Right? And and so you, the boundary condition comes from the fact that I have particles actually. They're they're not allowed to overlap. But my function Yes. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. It's a function of x and v. And the phase space is just Xi minus Xa has to be larger than whatever t. It's nothing to do with t. My variables matter. Even the vi. Yes. You must know the vi initially in order to design the q. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and uh, okay. okay. Any questions or comments? Well, it's, let me. I mean, it's the curiosity, it's historical curiosity. I mean, the six. Uh, Problem, Hilbert's problem. So I'm sure that, uh, I mean, Hilbert, I mean, reading the, the problem is, uh, to me, is not clear what he meant. So whether from particles directly to fluid, so the dynamical equation are different from mm -hmm. what is considered the starting from Boltzmann, or a particle to Boltzmann, or Boltzmann to fluids. Right. But this is your idea on that, because I mean, this, this problem, uh, if you read it uh, in uh, modern uh, knowledge, uh, we don't understand what he... I agree, but uh, he says something like, uh, Boltzmann's book suggests, I have forgot the sentence, that yes. says it suggests we could go from particles to fluids. So why does his book suggest, I don't know, but maybe because there was the equation inside, but I don't know, yeah, I, I have no idea. But uh, maybe no, that people understood this as uh, to use Boltzmann as an intermediate step, a step between, but uh, the uh, fluid dynamic elevation are the wrong ones at the end, because uh, they, they, you may mean, uh, 
the oil derivation is very special because the, the low temperature pressure is the, the one of the perfect gas. Mm -hmm. So it's a sort of uh, very small percent of oil elevation in the nation. It's, this is not quite often said. Uh, that's true. <laughs> you miss a lot of the questions. I think, yeah. So I don't. I have no idea what the next one is. Um, there's a question from uh, <coughs> Piero Marcati online. What do you mean with, with uh, understanding and to be cascades? Okay, so um, good question. What I mean is that the, the, the Boltzmann equation loses entropy okay, when the initial model does not, of course. And so one way of understanding what's going on is to understand where the entropy is gone. Okay? I mean, we've lost something, and you get the Boltzmann definitely a lot of information is gone. So since you want to do better and get a better result even with Boltzmann, it's important to know where the entropy is gone. And now the entropy cascade idea is that, uh, so a few years back, we studied with uh, Laurent Thierry the linearized Boltzmann equation. And we sort of written for the, the Fancy word for something you didn't really do, but it looks a little bit like an energy transfer. Uh, so the energy is just take x log x and linearize it against zero, we get x log. So it's normal to work on the energy if you linearize. And we've sort of gotten something like, uh, so I haven't talked about cumulants, but the L2 norm of the cumulants, the, the series is converging. Even if initially you only had one cumulant, not zero, then at time t, they're all open, all there, and the series is converging. So it looks a little bit like a cascade. So the idea is that probably at time epsilon, at time t, whatever t, the entropy is there for every cumulant, and maybe some theories is converging, maybe some cumulants mm -hmm. have a lot of entropy, some less, so that's what we have here. Yeah, but this result is just for the linear case. Yeah. For the moment, yes. Yeah, yeah. so okay. But hopefully, maybe one day we can send that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So. Okay. All the questions. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> and uh